Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. My name is Mufaro Makiwa, and I'm gonna take you guys through some uh, cool stuff about CSS. Uh, so just to give a quick recap uh, of what we have done so far, uh, we've learned that CSS uh, is just cascading style sheets, which uh, we use to describe how our HTML boxes would look like. Uh, so what are some of the things that we can do with CSS? I'm sure you've seen uh, some bit of CSS in the previous workshops, uh, but there's a lot we can actually do with CSS. So uh, first of all, uh, we have seen that we can see, uh, we can use CSS to govern how the layouts look like. Uh, for instance, the navigation bars. Uh, we can also use CSS to uh, style fonts, uh, add colors to it as well. Uh, we can also use CSS to add some borders around our, our buttons, uh, change the text color, add some shadows as well. Uh, and we can do so much more with CSS. Uh, you can see here, we can add some idle animations, which can make our projects look really nice. Uh, we can also create this complex layouts, as you can see on this sidebar. And uh, I'm sure you've seen uh, on many websites that you can I just hover on say an image or some text or a button, and then you see some cool animation happening. Uh, we can all achieve uh, that with CSS. And uh, you can also use CSS to uh, create uh, responsive uh, designs, which we're gonna talk about in more detail later on. So why do we care about CSS? Uh, you could probably say, uh, why can't I just uh, use the HTML elements as they are without any styling? Uh, it's just a website. Uh, what if, I mean, all that matters the, is, is the functionality. Uh, and the answer to this is uh, you might, you want to make sure that your website is something that someone would actually want to use. Uh, the website that you're gonna make is ultimately meant to be used by people. And uh, for them to actually want to use it, you want them to come back. Like the first time they use your website, you want someone to want to come back to your website and uh, you'd want to make sure that all your users have a comfortable user experience. And uh, it's nice for you to achieve this. It's possible to achieve this uh, using CSS. Uh, and I'm sure uh, you might have heard a lot of uh, platforms, uh, libraries you can use to style websites. Uh, you might have heard of something called Bootstrap, uh, which is one of them. You should have also heard uh, there are so many other platforms out there, like uh, Squarespace, uh, uh, WordPress, which you can use to uh, just create your own website without even writing any single line of code. So you probably wonder why should I even learn CSS in the first place when I can just use these platforms that exist already? And uh, the answer is you want to be able to have custom design for your websites. Uh, so what this means is most of these platforms, uh, it's possible to edit uh, what you might want. Say you want to move a button from say one corner to the next, but it's really hard to do so on some of these platforms. And some of them don't have documentation enough for you to be able to do it on your own. So knowing CSS means you can you have control, you have full control over every aspect of your design and you can easily change it without having to depend on someone to add documentation for that. So uh, now that we've seen some of the nice things that CSS can help us to do, uh, how can you make with CSS for your project? And uh, I'm gonna walk you through uh, five topics uh, just to ex show you some examples of things you can actually achieve uh, with CSS. And uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about uh, is color palettes. Uh, and uh, just to answer this question, why do you even care about color palettes? Uh, you are the one making the website, right? Uh, you can decide to add 10 colors, uh, add five colors, or any color you want, uh, it's your website. So why should you care about how it's gonna look and which colors you're gonna pick? And uh, just to answer this uh, this question, let's take a look at this uh, site here. I think we can all agree that you, you wouldn't want to actually use a website like this. You can make reference to the navigation bar here, like, the color contrast is something that you wouldn't really want to even look at because you can't really see what's written. Everything is just cluttered. There's so many colors here. And uh, 
just uh, a rule of thumb when you're trying when you're making your projects, uh, try to keep your theme colors between two and three. Uh, this can also make sure uh, that you don't have so many things that are going on uh, and end up having colors which uh, are not giving the good contrast to the users. And uh, just to reiterate on this, how many colors you want to have, uh, just two to three. Uh, so this is an example of uh, good contrast and bad contrast. As you can see on the left, you can easily see the text, but on the right, it's not really appealing to the eyes. Uh, so then you might ask yourself, uh, how do I know which colors to use? Uh, how do I know how to use a color palette? Like uh, maybe black and white, you know, black and white might go well together. What about other colors? How do I know how to pick them? And there's a nice website linked here. Uh, uh, we have linked here that we can uh, that, that you can use to come up with these color palettes. So it can help you to generate some color palettes which can give you good contrast uh, on your website. So we recommend you to use this when you're coming up with colors for, uh, for your final project. Uh, now moving on to the box model. Uh, so in the first uh, workshop, uh, I'll be talked a little bit about this, but just to uh, make sure that we remember what the box model is. Uh, so here you have uh, some main area you're working on. So in this case, you can see uh, there's some text welcome box, uh, I'm sorry, uh, welcome boss. And that's the main area you're working in. And the padding is what surrounds that main working area. And then the border surrounds the padding. And then the margin surrounds everything. So uh, I remember when I started to, uh, uh, when I took PubLab, I confused between, I was confused between margin and padding. And uh, just make sure that you know the difference between the two. And we're gonna walk through some examples as well that you try to uh, make sure that you understand how this two work. Uh, now moving on to layouts. So on layouts, we're gonna talk about two major properties, which is display and position. Uh, so display, basically what it does is it determines how the elements size and sit width and within each other. So uh, the first one we're gonna talk about is, dis uh, is display block, uh, which uh, is the default for uh, some elements like these. And uh, when you have display block uh, on an element, what it basically does is uh, the element will stretch uh, across the window and it always sit on a new line. So just to show you how this would look uh, when you have an element with display block uh, within some text, you would see that in this case, dummy is on a new line uh, because of the property display block. And then you have another property which is display inline. Uh, and when you assign uh, uh, this property on uh, say maybe a div or whatever, uh, it means uh, it's gonna appear in line with the text. Uh, so in this case, you won't have uh, the liberty to change the width, the height, or the padding. And to show you how this would look, uh, you can see in this case, dummy is the same height uh, as the other text, and you can't put margins or padding on this. But there are cases whereby you want to have uh, a mixture of the two, like in line and block, and our CSS can help you to do this using this property inline block. Uh, in this case, you have uh, your element uh, appearing in line with the text, but then you have the liberty to add uh, a height, uh, a width or margin and padding uh, to your elements. So this is how it would look when you have set some margin or padding uh, on your dummy. And uh, the other property, which is quite interesting, you might actually end up using this a lot in your projects, which is display none, for which the element is literally not there. And I'm going to show you an example where you might find display none useful. Uh, so in this case, you can see we have display none on that dummy div, and you can no longer see it in uh, within this text. But uh, enough about trying to put uh, our elements within uh, other text. What about when you want to uh, align boxes side by side within a container, uh, for instance? And uh, there are multiple solutions to display elements side by side. Uh, and we have talked about one of them, which is flex. Uh, so what flex uh, allows you to do is uh, you can flexibly uh, describe how the content would look like in a container. You can uh, set some properties to it that can allow you to arrange your uh, child elements within that container in any way you want. So in this case, you can see you have three boxes and you want to uh, have them in a row within this outer container. In this case, you have the outer container 
uh, which is the flex box, uh, and you set the property uh, for uh, you set the value for the property display to be flex. And then in this case, you have your three boxes uh, aligned horizontally within uh, within this container. And uh, there's so much more you can also do uh, when you are together with Flexbox. Uh, in this case, you can see uh, on the left hand side we have some nice CSS. You can set a, you can set some margins uh, on uh, your elements, some padding, also add some border edges uh, to the elements as well. Uh, you can also uh, determine uh, how certain elements would grow within a certain container. So in this case, you've assigned width 60% on the first card, uh, which means it's gonna take 60% of the size of this container. So you, you can see that uh, faint gray, uh, which is containing both uh, the left and the right uh, cards. So it means card one is taking 60% of that, and the others in the case of one is gonna take 40%, which is the remainder. Uh, and with Flex, uh, it allows you to, uh, like I said, uh, to have some nice layouts. Uh, in this case, suppose you want to, you have a big container and you have maybe two cards in this case, you want to align them to the ends of the container horizontally. Uh, with this uh, property, justify content, uh, you can set the value to be spaced between, uh, which means it's going to put a, sp uh, a space in between the elements, uh, as you can see here. And it can take more values as well. It can take center, it can take flex that, it can take specifically, uh, and you can experiment with these properties to see how uh, your elements would look. Uh, the next uh, property I'm going to talk about, uh, the value that you can give to display is grid. And uh, if you remember from uh, the second workshop on JavaScript, uh, we used a display grid uh, to uh, sort of like come up with the canvas for our snake game. Uh, and uh, it's just an example of how you can use display grid to come with some nice dude, uh, some nice 2D uh, layouts. So here you can see uh, where, uh, an example whereby you have a display grid in a container which contains three boxes and each of them is of the same width. Uh, and you can achieve this using this uh, property written with columns and you assign each of the boxes to have the same size with Vanifa for all of them. Uh, and another example here, suppose you want the first one to be twice the size of the rest. So you can just change the first uh, value to be 2FR. In this case, you have uh, another interesting layout uh, with the middle one being half the size of the other two. And uh, you can do so much more with uh, grid. In this case, you can see an example of uh, a two by three uh, grid, uh, and you can adjust the sizes as well. As you can see here, this is a three by two grid. Uh, and you can adjust the sizes of each of the rows and the columns as well. Uh, now moving on to position. So what position helps you to do is uh, it helps you to determine where an element would sit based on other elements. Uh, so with position, uh, the first one I'm gonna talk about is position static, which is uh, the default for most divs. So uh, when you have position static, uh, what it basically does is it's gonna render the boxes position based on their order in the document. Uh, and just to see how this works, you see here we have two boxes, uh, the first one and the second one. So in this case, because of display, uh, uh, because of position static, you are bound to have box two appearing right below box one in the order they have been defined in the HTML. Uh, but suppose you want to have box two uh, at a certain position relative to where it was supposed to be if it were static. Uh, you can achieve this using uh, another value we're gonna talk about for position, which is uh, relative. So this positions an element relative to where it would be if static. Uh, so you can use this to modify the position of some elements. So to achieve what we had seen previously, you can just set position relative on the second box and in this case, you want it to be 10 pixels from where it was supposed to be if it were static. So you assign top to be 10 pixels. But suppose in this case, you want to have box two to appear at the bottom of its outer container. So you can see the container for box one and box two. And you want uh, B2 to be at the, pot, uh, to be at the bottom. Uh, what you could do probably you could try to play around with uh, the value you put for position top, maybe put top 1000 pixels or whatever. But this is bound to break because you might have different sizes for the auto container. So the way you can achieve this is using position absolute. Uh, and what it does is it positions the element 
relative to the first ancestor, which is positioned non-statically. So this can be useful for nav bars or sidebars. Uh, and you might have seen in most cases where you have a nav bar at the top, which stays at the top even when you scroll. So here, what you would do, you would assign position absolute on B2. And then since you want it to be at the bottom of its outer container, you then put bottom zero pixels. So it's gonna make sure that it's gonna, uh, box two would stay at the bottom of the container. And now there's another challenge. Suppose uh, you want box two to stay fixed at the bottom of a screen. So you can see with this blue border, this is your screen. Uh, and you want to say when you scroll, box two stays at the bottom of the container. Uh, in this case, this might not be possible to achieve with a uh, position. You might have to play around with a lot of values. So the way you can do this is using what's called position fixed. Uh, and this fixes the element relative to the screen. And uh, this can also be used for numbers, uh, which stay at the top of the screen or sidebars, which are always on the sides. And uh, the way you would achieve this is you'd assign position fixed on B2. And since you wanted to be at the bottom left corner, you set bottom and left to be zero pixels. So now to see how all this we talked about, uh, all this we've been talking about, how it would look in some code, uh, I created uh, a simple example here. Uh, so here, as you can see, this is an ugly website. I don't think you would even want to come back and use this uh, after this class uh, because we didn't add any CSS to it. But then uh, after doing some bit of CSS, uh, let me just move to, So after adding some bit of CSS, you can see this looks better. I mean, I wouldn't say beautiful because uh, beauty is relative, but this looks better than what we had previously. So uh, just to go over this uh, simple application that we have, uh, is just a simple component, uh, an app component, uh, which contains uh, a navigation bar here. And uh, when you click on each of these uh, links, uh, it's just going to give you an alert. And uh, this is because of this function that I added, the function handler. And uh, we have a main block, which is containing uh, our cat image, which we have uh, rounded and centered. And in this case, we have this button, which when you click, uh, it's going to review a secret. My name is Cody. And when you close it, it's going to hide it. And uh, the way we achieve this is through conditional rendering, which uh, uh, Vincent talked about in uh, his lecture on on Wednesday. And uh, this is uh, also using React State, which we've been talking about uh, in the previous workshop as well. So here, when you click on this button, uh, what it's going to do is going to call this function toggle secret and then set the state uh, variable to true. Uh, when it sets it to true, now because of conditional rendering, uh, we only render this button when display secret is false or this secret, uh, if otherwise. So when you click on this clause, it's going to toggle it back to false. And yeah, so this is basically the functionality of the whole application. Uh, and now moving on to our CSS. So we talked about position earlier on, and uh, one of the properties we talked about was uh, and the values for position was fixed. And in this case, to see how this is actually working, if I'm to resize this page, if I scroll, you see the navigation bar stays at the top. And we can achieve this through position fixed. So in this case, we have the nav bar fixed at the top. And then we said to left, that the left and the right to be zero as well to make sure that it stays at the top uh, aligned to the left and the right. And uh, the other thing we talked about was uh, the box module, uh, talking about margins and headings. And uh, just to show you how this would look, uh, if I'm to comment out this line here, the padding that I set on this top navigation bar, uh, and then I remove this height. If I save this, you see this is not as nice as it was before, at least in my, uh, from my own point of view. So you can see that adding some padding uh, to your navigation bars, uh, I mean, not just navigation bars, to some of the elements can make them look uh, far much better. Uh, but then to see the difference between margin and padding, if I'm to uncomment uh, this line here and change this to margin, now you see what's happening. It's adding a margin around the navigation bar. So here you see what you talked about. Margin is outside, but padding is what's 
uh, right after your, your content in the container. So in this case, we want this to be padding uh, to add some uh, breathing room around uh, the elements and so on in our navigation bar. And when you save this, you see there's a nice padding. Uh, and just to bring it back to where it was. So yeah, this is it for our navigation bar. But uh, we also talked about, actually before I move on, uh, there's one other thing which I think you might not have seen before. Uh, this is this function in CSS called calc. So uh, what this helps you to do is, uh, there are cases whereby, suppose you have defined some CSS variables. In this case, I've defined this nav, uh, this nav height and uh, this other size XSL, which is I think 40 pixels if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and you might want to do some method calculations in, uh, in your CSS. And the way you can achieve that is by using this function called calc. So what I have done here, I've just added a margin top on this main block, which is, which you, if you remember, was right below at the navigation bar. And if I'm to just comment out this line to see what, uh, what's the effect of this margin top, you will see our content is now below the nav bar. And why this happens is because when you set position fixed on an element, uh, it takes it out of, out of the flow of the document. So in this case, that's why even if in our HTML like code in our component, you see main is right below the navigation bar, but you see it actually appearing below it because this nav is out of the flow of this document. So the way that we can sort of like work around this is I want to put space at the top of this main content. And I want the space at the top to equal the height of the navigation bar. So what I can do is I can simply add a margin to the top of that, which is equal to the size of the navigation bar, I mean the height of the navigation bar. So if I do this, you can see that the uh, content now appears right below uh, the navigation bar. But what I want is to add some bit of space as well, uh, right below the content of the navigation bar. And I can achieve this by just adding some bit of margin to what I've added already. So in this case, you can see it appears perfectly right below this. So uh, this is just to explain uh, this function in case you might find it handy in your projects. Uh, some of the CSS, uh, I can post this code afterwards in case you want to make reference to it in your project. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, we talked about display none. And uh, here in our component, when we are rendering this secret, when you click on this and then you close, uh, we do it using conditional rendering. But what if I tell you that there's another way you can do it uh, by making use of display none. So if I uncomment this piece of code here, this is the same as what we have up there. If I come to our cat book club, it still works the same. And you can ask yourself, here it looks like there is no conditional rendering, all the elements are there on the page, but how is it that I can only see one at a time? And the way we achieve this is by alternating which one is the property display none. So the way we do this is for this secret, we want to display it only when display secret is true. So when display secret is true, we want to not hide this. So if you come to app.css, I have defined a class called hidden, which is display none. And I conditionally add that class to either the button or the secret container if display secret is true or false. So in this case, if display secret is false, which is when we don't want to show the secret, I'm going to add this class hidden. And this is going to set the display property of this div to none, which means you won't see it on the page. It's there, but you won't see it. And I do the opposite for this button. So this is just to show you uh, how you can make use of some of these properties uh, in your CSS uh, and in your project as well. So now we can move on to uh, the next part. So uh, the next thing I want to talk about uh, is transitions and animations. And uh, what transition helps you to do, it, uh, it helps you, uh, it determines how changes in properties can show up on your screen. So here you can see, uh, an example of how you can set uh, a transition uh, on an element. And I'm going to show you as well how it works uh, in our Cat Book Club example. So here, uh, to define a, uh, a transition, you add the property that you are changing or that you want to transition through. And then you also add uh, the time span for the change to happen. And you also add uh, 
how the change, uh, how you want the change to show. So in this case, you want it to ease in uh, when you go through this transition. Uh, and I'm going to show you how this transition is going to uh, make our, our example look better. Uh, the next thing is animations, which basically defines keyframes that you want to transition through. And uh, just to see how this two, I can make our example look far much better. Uh, I'm going to come back to our code. And uh, I'm going to check out to the branch in which we've added some nice animations. So uh, right. So here, uh, we've added a nice animation to our cat. You can see it's doing this uh, nice CSO animation. And then you can ask yourself, how are we achieving this? Uh, and before I talk about this animation, I want to talk about transition for a bit. So uh, here, if you noticed, when I hover on this, uh, on these navigation tabs, you see there's a nice uh, transition from the actual size to a scaled up size. And this is all because of this uh, hover uh, class that I added, uh, the cell that I added for this, uh, each of these uh, uh, list items. And if I'm to just change this to 1.5, if I hover on each of these, you will see it's sort of like scaling in a nice uh, transition is sort of like just easing in. But then if I'm to comment out this line 35 that I've added to signal the transition for this list item, if I hover on this now, you see the way it's changing. It's just uh, changing instantly the moment that I put my case on this. So adding a transition, I can show you how I can make your uh, elements uh, and some of uh, the animations in your site uh, appear smoothly. And uh, here, if I bring back the transition, you can see it's changing smoothly, uh, which is in my, from my own point of view, is better than what we had previously. And uh, even on this uh, secret button, uh, I also added uh, a transition on the background color. So if I'm to comment out this, it might not really be apparent because the colors are somewhat similar. But in this case, you can see it's just changing instantly the moment I put the cursor on it. If I'm to uncomment this line, if I come back, you see there's a smooth uh, transition from one color to the next. So yeah, I try to use transitions in, uh, in the projects. They can make them look uh, a lot better. Now coming to this animation that you can see uh, for our cat. So what we have done, we've added this animation on uh, this image. And uh, the way that you define an animation is you define the name, or you add the name of the animation, which you choose on your own. Uh, and then you add the time, the time span for how you want the animation to change. There's so many ways to define animations. This is just one of them. Uh, and to know more details about this, uh, you can always go on MDN to find more examples about this. Uh, and this is sort of like the function of uh, showing how you want the animation to change. In this case, you want it to happen uh, in a linear fashion. So I'm just going to change this uh, to a change. Uh, so I've defined this uh, animation here. And remember, we said you define uh, an animation simply defining some keyframes uh, you want the transition to go through. So in this case, with this uh, animation that I defined, the way you do it is by putting this at keyframes, which sort of like signals that this is an animation. And then you add the name for the animation. So you choose the name you want. If I was to change this to anything else, it would still work, but you'd have to make sure that you specify the name when you're adding the animation property to your elements. So in this case, uh, I define the keyframes for this rotate animation. You see, I want to rotate from zero degrees to 359 right, be uh, right below its previous one revolution. And this is why you can see the smooth rotation of the cat. Uh, another animation that uh, I created for you guys is this uh, translated animation. Uh, and what uh, this uh, what this does is uh, translate. Okay, you can see our cache is sort of like translating from left to right. And how we define this is by specifying how you want to change uh, during the time span for the uh, for the animation. You said you want this to happen in four seconds, so we want it zero percent to be at position zero. So this is uh, sort of like this left to right animation is because of this transform property. And you want to translate this in the X direction. 
So you want it to be uh, at zero pixels. Uh, I mean, at the center at the beginning, and then at 25%, you want it to be 20 pixels to the left, I mean, to the right. Uh, 75% 20, minus 20 pixels to the left, and then at 100% back to zero. If you change this to maybe translate Y, you would see it translating the Y axis. Uh, and another animation uh, that I also added is this curl animation, which is sort of like changing it from 0%, uh, I mean, like from uh, times one to times 0 0.5. So the way we define this, uh, we just wanted to say at 50%, it scales down to 0 0.5%, I, I mean, to, to 0, 0 0.5 times. And then at 0 and 100, it comes back to uh, times one. And you can also combine this with source C so earlier on. I can also combine all these animations to create some cool uh, animations on some of the elements. So I created this one, translate scale CISO, which sort of like mashes up all these three. Uh, and in this case, if I'm to add this animation here, you will see how it's happening. It's doing this cool animation and uh, you can see the keyframes we defined for this. So uh, yes, you can see, I think you might have noticed we most of these animations are using this transform property. You can add animations based on other properties as well. Uh, for our review my secret button, you can also add some animation. Uh, in this case, I uh, named this blink. And the keyframes for this, uh, okay, I'm supposed to uncomment this entire block. And uh, here, as you can see, it's changing colors from that gray to this uh, nice blue. So this is sort of like transitioning two keyframes for the background color. So we created this variable uh, primary dim in index.css, which uh, is this nice blue color. So you can see it's doing this transition uh, from 0% is this nice blue color, and then to 50% goes back to gray, and then 100% back to blue. So you can play around with these animations to create some cool animations for your projects. And uh, you might have also seen uh, this thing that I've added, uh, animation placed it. Uh, so on this image, when I hover on this, you see it pauses. When I remove the castle on this, it continues. It's because of this uh, property animation placed it, which I set to pause. So it pauses the animation on this image whenever I place my castle on top of it. So these are ways for you to play around with animations. And you can find more about what you can add for animations are on MDN. Uh, now moving on to uh, responsive layouts. So uh, what responsive layouts allow, allow you to do is to uh, make your website be user-friendly on different gadgets. Uh, so you can see here you have a nice website uh, which looks differently on all these uh, gadgets. And you can achieve this through CSS. And the way you do it is using what are called media queries. So you can decide how to, like, you can make your code run certain CSS only when the dev, uh, only when the screen size is uh, at a certain size, or when the device supports maybe hovering, uh, when the device uh, supports certain colors, and uh, there's a lot of things you can do with media queries. And just to show you how uh, this actually works, if we go to uh, weblab.mit.edu, uh, you will notice that uh, if I resize the window, uh, it's the, nav uh, the navigation bar changes to this little hamburger menu. And when you click on it, it now draws from the left. And uh, this can be really nice because on the phone, uh, you can easily use this website, right? And uh, one interesting tool that I want to show you if you're using Chrome is uh, you can test uh, certain breakpoints of your website. If you just right click on any element, uh, and click on inspect, uh, you can see this, this icon on, in your, uh, at the bottom left corner. If you click on this, it can give you this nice layout uh, for which you can view how your website looks like on different gadgets. So in this case, you can see how this would look like when a Galaxy Fold, uh, which is still responsive. Uh, you can still even use it on a Galaxy Fold. Uh, but the one that I normally use is this responsive one for which you can try to resize uh, your page and you can see maybe where you might want to add some breakpoints. So in this case, I think it's at seven, uh, I forgot exactly what it is, but I think it's 730 pixels. When you get 730 pixels, uh, it should be 730 if I remember. 
it changes to this hamburger menu. But the moment that you go to 731 and above, it now changes back to this uh, full navigation bar stretched out. So this can help you to make your websites uh, uh, responsive and uh, be accessible easily on all the gadgets. And now coming back to our, uh, to our Cat Book Club, in this case, if I'm to right click on this navigation bar, and then uh, you will see as I resize this window, uh, it's not looking that nice. Like you can see uh, the way that it's changing. Some of the uh, tabs are not even showing up on the screen. Uh, and we can achieve uh, the same functionality we have on the web -like website by adding some media queries. So I'll show you how that would look like in code. Uh, so first of two. Uh, okay, so now uh, if I refresh this page, uh, you will see that when I resize this page, uh, when it hits 800 pixels, uh, let me close this uh, for, it to, for it to be small. So you will see when I'm resizing this page, uh, when I get to 800 pixels, uh, you see uh, those tabs come back. Uh, but when I hit 800 pixels, it's changing to this uh, little hamburger menu. And uh, the way we're achieving this is by using media queries. So down here, I have defined some classes that I want to be applied to my elements only when the maximum width is 800 pixels. So when it's 800 pixels and below, what I want is I want to apply certain classes which I have defined here. I'm just going to go over these classes in a moment. Uh, so if I come back to my app.js, we added a few things. So there's a library uh, called Font Awesome that you can use to define, uh, uh, you can use to add some icons to your project. There is many, uh, uh, there are so many libraries you can use. This is just one of them. Uh, so using this Font Awesome icon, I've, in, I've imported uh, this FA bus, which is the one that looks like the under the menu, and then this times, which looks like uh, the little X. So when I click on this icon, you see it changes to this X, but then it's not actually draw, uh, showing the, uh, what you call this, that side, uh, the, that side, but with those navigation elements. Uh, I'll leave that as an exercise, exercise to you if you want to continue working on this. But what's happening is, if I come back to my navigation bar, I added this button, uh, which when I click uh, changes the state variable display menu uh, and sets it to true. And when it's true, that's when I conditionally apply, uh, I add this icon either FA times or FA bus, depending on what uh, display menu is. So when I want to display the menu, when I click on this, it, it changes to this uh, X and changes back to the ambiguous menu. But uh, the way that we are doing, we are achieving uh, this functionality is through the use of display none, which we talked about earlier. So if I come to my CSS, by default, I don't want to show this button that allows you to toggle between uh, that hamburger menu. Uh, I mean, like uh, to sort of like trigger the navigation uh, menu from the left to whatever, however you want it to show up. By default, I have it set to display none. I don't want it to be on the screen. But when I hit 800 pixels and less, what I want is I now want to show that button. So now I define the style that I want to apply to this button only when it's 800 pixels and less. So here I define the styles for this button. Uh, now I set it to, to display block and uh, just some custom styles to make uh, this uh, button look better. But then I don't want to show that, uh, that unordered list which contained uh, those list items for the tabs. So now I set this to display none whenever I add any pixels or less. So that's what helps us to hide uh, that uh, uh, that navigation. Uh, uh, what you call this? That uh, unordered list which contains the uh, the navigation tabs. Uh, so that's basically it about uh, how we achieved this uh, functionality. And you might have also noticed when I hit eight hundred pixels, uh, this cat size is changing. Uh, it's sort of like changing sizes so smoothly. And uh, the way we achieve the same functionality here is using transition, which we talked about earlier on. So if I come to the style, which I have defined for the cat, uh, for this image here, 
I said a transition uh, to happen in 0 0.3 seconds. If I'm to comment out this line, and then I save this, when I change the size of the screen, you see it's just happening instantly. And uh, I don't think this would be as nice as when you see that smooth transition. So editing transitions can make things happen smoothly and uh, can be nice to give a better user experience. And uh, what I've done as well is I've set the maximum width of this cat to be 400 pixels by default. But then when the size of the screen, uh, when the width is 800 pixels or less, I want the maximum width to be 250. So that's why you see it resize uh, nicely when I, uh, uh, when I change from 800 pixels uh, when I go uh, beyond it. So yeah, that's it about responsive design. Uh, we can move on. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about special CSS selectors. So uh, a recap of what you've uh, seen already, you can, uh, I think you've seen that you can style some elements without even have to specify classes for them. Uh, like in this case, you can just uh, add styles to some elements by just, uh, by just using the name of the element. Like in this case, you can use the anchor tag. In our uh, example, we just used uh, nav in our CSS. Uh, to style the, uh, what you call this, to style the navbar. You can also add classes uh, to, our, to the elements. Like you notice for some of them, we're adding like some nice classes to them. You can also style elements by using IDs. Uh, you can assign IDs to elements, but just to touch a little bit on IDs, uh, we strongly discourage you from using IDs uh, when you define your, uh, when, you're, when you're defining your, uh, what you call this, your layouts. Uh, because uh, the problem with IDs is you might make a mistake of defining two elements with the same ID. And it may give you some problems when you try to maybe style one element and see them apply to the other element. So try by all means to not use IDs when you're defining your uh, elements in your HTML. So uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is CSS combinators. Uh, so what this helps you to do is it can help you to uh, define certain styles uh, depending on some combinations. Uh, I'm just gonna show you uh, an example of this. So here you can see, suppose you want to select every P tag which follows an H2. You can do it using uh, the plus operator. Uh, suppose you want to select uh, every span uh, which follows a P tag. You can do it using that R2 uh, And suppose you want to select every OI element uh, which is directly inside in an ordered list. You can do it using this uh, greater than sign for, for a child. And uh, suppose you want to select every descendant, or in this case, you want to select every span, which is in a div. So this can apply to a span which is directly in a div, or a span which is inside another div in an outer div. So this applies to all the spans, uh, even at, at, uh, regardless of how nested they are inside the div. And just an example of how this actually works, you can see uh, we have an, an, an ordered list uh, at the top and an ordered list. And if you want to style a list item, which is directly inside an unordered list, you see the first one is blue and the second one is red. Uh, there's also what I called uh, CSS pseudo classes. Uh, and you've seen one of them already, which is uh, which you used when you're trying to apply some, class, uh, some styling when you're hovering on an element. Uh, so this can be used to specify uh, is selected that is not directly represented in, in the HTML. Uh, so this is just an example. Uh, some of them are active focus. Uh, there's a lot you can learn more about this on MDN. Uh, we have added the link here. Uh, and this is an example of seeing how pseudo classes are, are applied to this uh, simple HTML. Uh, and there are also uh, what are called pseudo elements. And uh, these are used to specify styles for some parts of a selected element. So you can see some examples here of uh, uh, some pseudo elements that you can use to specify certain things. Uh, and here you can see uh, this pseudo classes, uh, this pseudo elements being used uh, to style the text on the left. Uh, and just to show you uh, how we can actually use some pseudo elements in our code, I'm gonna come back to our example here. Uh, and I'm gonna check out to this branch. And uh, what we have done now in our example, when I place my cursor on this button, you see this nice text that shows up uh, that says click me. So I uh, just show you all this up. It's like a cool animation that's happening. And you have seen this happen on so many, like uh, I think on Twitter, 
if you hover on maybe that uh, favorite icon, you see either a like or an like pop up. Even in this uh, browser, if I right click, uh, if I place my case on this plus, you see that new tab pop up. So this is quite a two tip, and it can be nice uh, to add to sort of like add more information about what maybe a button or a certain element does in your uh, in your project. So the way we achieve this is by using the after pseudo element. And uh, just to show you how this looks like in code, what we want is I want to show this nice uh, click me text or this nice label whenever I place my case on top of this button. And the way that we do that is by defining this pseudo element, which I call after. And uh, in this case, what I want is I want this to show up 120% from the top of this button. And uh, the way that I have done it by, is by setting, uh, by setting position absolute on this pseudo element. But then remember position absolute, you want it to be relative to the button, not to the page. So that's why I've set position relative on the element itself, which is the button. If I remove this position relative here, which I have set on this button, uh, if I hover on this, you no longer see it because it's now relative to the uh, outside container. I think it's actually below the navigation, but if I'm not mistaken. So just uh, be careful when you are uh, trying to use absolute, the case when, when you might have to define position relative on the outer container. And in this case, uh, I have sort of like edit styles for this, uh, for this, uh, uh, this two tip that shows up. Uh, you can look at the CSS uh, just to add some, to, just to make it look better. But then there's sort of like this thing that's happening it's not showing up instantly the moment I place my case on top of this button. There's like a delay. And you can achieve the same functionality using transition. So if you remember on transition, uh, you might have seen it just take two things, like either the thing you want to change and then like uh, the time span for the change to happen. You can also add a delay uh, for the transition to happen. So if I change this 0 0.2 seconds to one second and I save this, when I place my case on this, it takes a second for this to, to, to show up. And then it takes a second for it to just disappear as well. Uh, but then how is it showing up only when I place my case and then it's sort of like disappearing when I remove the case. And I'm achieving this by defaulting this after element to be scaled down to zero. So you can see this property here. I said, I transform this and scale it down to zero. And uh, whenever I hover on this button, I want to scale it back up to one. So that's why you see it do this nice animation when I place my case on this, just to scale it back up. So this is just a way for you to make use of pseudo elements uh, uh, in your CSS. And just as an extra, uh, if you want to make this look, uh, if you want to just uh, use some bit of React uh, together with your pseudo elements, uh, let me just uh, check out this branch. Uh, uh, just a moment. Uh, so here, uh, what I've done is when I place my case on this button, you see what's happening. It's sort of like changing the text, uh, but how, are we, how can you achieve this functionality? Uh, in this case, now you might want to add some bit of JavaScript. Uh, and this uh, is just one thing I love about CSS, you can do a lot of things. So the way we achieve this is by using something we call, uh, this function called uh, this ATTR function, uh, as you can see in line 172. Uh, but how is this happening? So I'm gonna switch to app.js for a bit. Uh, and the way this is happening is, uh, suppose you want to pass in some attributes to your element uh, from JavaScript for you to access them in CSS. The way you can do that is in this case, you can say I'm passing this thing called data, uh, called data two tip on this button. So this attribute, you can access it inside uh, your CSS. And uh, like I said, the way you do that is through this, using this function here, and then I specify the name of the attribute that I passed in from the button. So here, if I'm to change this text from, uh, I'm gonna explain uh, what I had initially there. If I change this to click me, 
Uh, and also I may have to comment out this, but I'm gonna explain this uh, in a moment. If I change this to click me, uh, I'm now trying to show this two tip uh, in CSS. When I press my cursor here, it still works because it's just accessing this, uh, uh, this attribute I passed in uh, from my JavaScript. But then uh, suppose you want, uh, okay, now that we can do this to sort of like play uh, with CSS and uh, JavaScript and all yet, this can help you to do a lot of things from uh, JavaScript. Like in this case, we can now pass in different uh, uh, values to this tooltip uh, at certain intervals. And the way we, we I have set this up is by creating this, uh, this state variable called tooltip. And uh, initially this is set to click me. And what I want to do is I want to say after each and every second, it changes to something else. So the way that I've achieved this is by creating an interval and I have declared this interval in my use effect. And here, uh, I just have a list of some uh, labels I want to use. Uh, like you've clicked me, you've come on, do it, whatever. And I set an interval for me to change the uh, tooltip after each and every second. So if you remember, when you're trying to use a function like set, set timeout or set interval, uh, this is in milliseconds. So this is a second, 1,000 millisecond, uh, 1,000 milliseconds. So after each and every second, uh, because of this, this three lines of code, I'm changing uh, the value of that two tip uh, state variable. So what that means is because of how React is uh, reactive, whenever uh, a state variable changes, it renders the page, right? So now it's basically just gonna re-render the page every time uh, this uh, state variable changes. And now it helps you to achieve this cool effect when you place this enter, uh, I mean, uh, when you press, uh, when you place your case on top of this button, you see this uh, cool thing happening uh, with this tooltip. So yeah, there is a lot we can talk about uh, when it comes to CSS, uh, but is this all that you can do with CSS? The answer is no. You can do so much more with CSS. There's so much more you can do. This is just uh, a tip of the iceberg. You can do a lot of things. And uh, I hope uh, this lecture uh, should uh, help you to sort of like build some bit of interest uh, when it comes to uh, CSS and what you can actually use it and how you can use it in your projects. So uh, that's it for today. I hope you guys learned a lot from this. I don't know if there's any announcements from Claire. Oh yeah, so um, if you haven't signed up for Milestone 1, please make sure your team is signed up for Milestone 1 by tonight because presentations start tomorrow and you have to present if you are competing or taking for credit for both. And if you have friends who are not here right now, please tell them to do that too. Great, oh, also we have office hours like right now. Um, like enter yourself if you want to save off stars, enter yourself on the queue and put like your breakout room or yeah. Great. Thanks for coming.